Okay, it appears to be time to start. And as I mentioned before, um, yeah, I'm not sure about 2049 for me. <laughs> uh, but uh, welcome to Science Circle. And what I'd like to do today is, and feel free to ask questions and comment and text during the presentation. And what I'd like to do today is something a little different. What I'd like to do first is I'd like to invite you on a journey together. And many people over thousands of years have taken this journey uh, themselves, but it's always more fun to travel together. So let me describe what I have mind for us. Okay, let's, let's talk about a little bit about uh, the uh, theory of science. First of all, um, are there any artists or musicians out there? Anybody an artist, musician, other creator? Yeah, <laughs> that's like me. I've play, been playing violin since fourth grade, but I haven't done it for uh, years now. Uh, but I like it. Oh, quilt. Okay, good. That's another uh, creative endeavor. Now, is anyone getting paid for it? <laughs> yeah. Um, anybody raising their hand on getting paid? Okay, so what I'm suggesting is that we're, oh, there you go, wow. Okay, what I'm suggesting is that you can be a scientist without getting paid for it, without being a professional scientist, uh, the same way you can with artists or uh, musicians. Um, I also would like to propose that uh, artists and musicians are creative people and they view art or listen to music or create it themselves uh, because it makes them feel good, because it inspires them about the wonders of human expression. Um, they rarely do it for practical purposes. So I will propose that everyone out there is a scientist because they like science. It makes them feel good about the wonders of the world around them. And uh, what your reward is, if it's not compensation, is knowledge and understanding of our world. And that could be uh, both humbling and wondrous at the same time. It's only been fairly recently that we've come to uh, demand that something practical come of it. And that's pretty much because of uh, uh, money backing and such for doing science. Okay, so what do all scientists have in common here? Just like uh, all artists and museums and musicians and stuff may be creative, what do um, all scientists have in common? Curiosity, okay? That's the prerequisite for a science. Is, is there's actually a book out. Uh, okay, there you go, a calling. In other words, it's something that you're drawn to rather than a profession. You can have it as a profession, so you spend a, a lot of time on it, but basically it's a calling. So there was a book in 2012 uh, by uh, Philip Ball uh, named Curiosity, How Science Became Interested in Everything. And uh, there, ooh, yes. In fact, actually, uh, one of the things, if you actually read about professional musicians, like uh, the people in Queens and stuff, uh, some of them are quite educated as well as talented. And a um, lot of, lot of, yeah, a lot of different uh, uh, knowledge and, and skills and music just happens to be one of them. And they experiment a lot with music as well. So in any case, in this book, um, he starts out by talking about the lar Large Hadron Collider. Anyone know that or what I'm talking about? Okay. Um, yeah, particle accelerator. And why do we have it? I mean, it took 25 years to plan, $6 billion to uh, build, and it's similar to the types of spacecraft that go uh, exploring the planets and stuff like that. So why? Why do we have it? Is there anything practical that will come out of it? Well, for scientists, it doesn't always have to be practical. Now, actually, there will be. Not, yeah, not in the short term. Um, but 
one of the things that uh, came, one of the things during the time it was uh, being built was that instead of hailing it as an incredible advance in technology, one of probably the most one of the more complicated machines that humans have ever, ever uh, devised and created, is that you sometimes got in the in the media uh, fixated about the fear that it would create a black hole and destroy the earth, and then other people were saying, "Wow, all the money going into it." Why can't we feed the poor or other types of things? And so even in this day and age, uh, there is a, when we talk about science and uh, we talk about perhaps our fears and uh, that it's not doing something practical, but in reality, we can't know what it can do. Um, just like, in other words, just like um, Syzygy mentioned is, Science is about the unknown, and we do science in order to find out about how things work. Um, Albert Einstein had a quote up there, the important thing is not to stop questioning, never to lose a holy curiosity. We'll come back to the, that term in a minute about why he may have used that. But some of the big jumps in innovation and technology and science have come about through pure curiosity. And if they didn't have the curiosity, they would not have discovered electricity and radio and radioactivity and radar and plastics and uh, antibiotics like penicillin. And okay, it's interesting that you mentioned basic um, research and stuff because my next quote here is from uh, Stephen Hawking's is that a lot of our modern science is based on advances in pure science. Now, what is pure science? Because that's essentially Syzygy mentioned this. Sciencers, I like that. That's a good term. <laughs> but what's pure science as opposed to what? Okay, wow, that's a good um, example. Uh, Tiki, go ahead. Uh, on, in our protocol here, and for people that haven't been in here for a while, you can just kind of speak out in chat. It's um, thing more theoretic. Yeah, okay, there you go. In other words, the idea is pure science is it, it's the it's what we do because okay it will be exciting and uh, so we we do it simply because we want to learn and in a lot of cases like um, the space program and stuff there has been quite a, a bit of return on that but it's not necessarily done for return as uh, now on the other hand applied science because and this mainly came after uh, World War II uh, anyone know about uh, Vanna Let's say I'm pronouncing it right. Vannevar Bush, uh, 1945, he uh, made a great paper that basically said we need more scientific research. This led to a lot of government funding of research, but then because it was public dollars, this is in the United States, uh, a lot of public dollars, so they had to account for those public dollars, and that's where a lot of the grant um, organizations came about trying to account for dollars, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, if there wasn't something practical coming from it, then it was less likely you might get money. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay, welcome. We still have people showing up. Welcome, Berrigan. Okay, now if you look at this, this slide's a little noisy, so you may want to um, zoom in on it. Uh, but the idea behind, behind this slide is that it shows, uh, this is what's called the research onion <laughs> um, from about a decade ago. And it starts with uh, kind of a philosophical background. In other words, is anyone, any physicists in the audience here? Yeah, ah, it does me too. <laughs> but the, oh, there are some physicists. Okay, does anyone know like what? positivism or interpretivism or post-positivism or stuff. I'm not a philosopher, but I can explain a little bit what that means. 
In particular, positivism was kind of what we thought about uh, science at the beginning. In other words, it's a philosophy that there's a certain knowledge. It's where the idea of facts come in. Uh, that And that when we study the world around us, that we should try our level best to kind of be outside of our study. In other words, we don't want to contaminate it with our own thoughts or opinions. And then about a hundred years ago, somebody said, well, you know, you really can't do that. I mean, everybody who observes something, who measures something, is measuring what they think is significant and uh, or observable. And so most of what we do is based on our own background and knowledge and values and what we think uh, is important. And so that was kind of a post-positivist uh, philosophy about science. Um, later on, and, and that became more popular in the 70s, or at least more acknowledged in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and through today. And then there was the idea that uh, interpretivism, that uh, we ourselves, uh, researchers, we're, we're the primary instrument of observation. So what we can do is we can kind of train ourselves uh, to be able to interpret the meaning behind people's actions and what they say and such. Um, and so it's a, it, it came all the way from humans are not part of nature, so to speak, and we should stay out of it to we're very much a part of the whole thing. We need to acknowledge our prejudices and biases and uh, experience uh, so that we, so that people reading what we do and reading our research and science can then go, oh yeah, okay, I understand how you uh, relate to this and uh, therefore I know how your philosophies and such have um, um, become a part of it. So that's kind of what this says up there. And so, and then of course you can read the other parts as so that if you, as you get down through the onion, you get into the area where you're actually collecting data and you're looking at different approaches to the phenomenon and stuff. And I won't go through all of that right now, but for you researchers, it should be a pretty uh, familiar territory there. Okay, but I would like to come back to some basics. Okay, so truth, belief, and science. Anyone want to volunteer on? One of those, I'm going to talk a bit about science here, but that's why I'm doing it. What is truth or belief? Is there belief in science? Is there truth? We know there's science. <laughs> okay, so belief, what is required for belief? Are there any requirements? Uh, yeah, there's both. And truth, um, it can be, okay, I would say it can be proved from a philosophical standpoint. Yeah, okay, now, yeah, I am too, Baragon. In other words, when people say they believe in science, and that's kind of why I brought this up. Now, there are, it's the same way as when we take a look at this post-positive post -positive, um, acceptance of premises or previously established uh, facts are accepted. Okay, so, so there's a lot of, ways of looking at this. But let me propose that in science, there are some beliefs that then can be proved. In other words, the idea, one of them is, is that if I study another solar system, like what they're doing uh, now. In fact, actually, if you look at one of the latest uh, news is they found a water vapor around one of the uh, planets around another star. And uh, it may not be a habitable um, place because it's a larger Earth and such, but... Um, <laughs> okay, well, now, you know, Ariane, you, you have an interesting point, and I'm going to get back to that, about um, the Earth spinning and stuff and how can we believe. I mean, right here, of course, right here, if you're sitting on Earth, it's hard to believe that the Earth's spinning because everything is going in the same speed. And so from a relativistic standpoint, it's hard to pinpoint that it's spinning unless you look out at uh, far away objects like the stars and see that they're all, so, they're all moving uniformly through the sky. So that means either they're moving or we're moving. 
And if we know that they're very far away, that have to be moving very fast. So in other words, you can kind of um, make some reasoning to assume that oh, maybe we're moving or, or the Earth may be spinning around. Um, Oh, okay. Now that's a very good point. And we're going to get back to that. The idea that um, theory is not subject to revision and such like that. Uh, so, because that's part of what science, in fact, actually science is predicated on the idea that anything can be challenged and good scientists uh, want to see real evidence that might challenge what their theories are so that they can modify them so that they better explain the real world. That's all uh, part and parcel of um, science. Uh, yes, and actually Tiki, we're going to get to the scientific process. Right now I'm kind of going through the kind of the theory and ideas about science and that's, that's exactly uh, right. In other words, we all kind of agree on a way to look at it. Um, what we might say in science, though, is there's really no truth. A lot of people, though, do have truths. There's things that they hold to be true. Uh, in science, that's hard um, to say. There are theories. In other words, I could probably bet my life that the sun's going to come up in a particular position as long as I know how to read the charts. <laughs> But um, I wouldn't say it's a absolute truth. Um, I would say that it's a theory. It explains uh, what we see and, and observe. Okay. So uh, in particular in science, uh, there needs to be evidence. And it's an observable or uh, the physical world. In other words, science has nothing to say about um, things we can't observe, measure, um, we can say they're mathematically possible. We were talking about parallel worlds earlier, and or parallel universes, and yes, they're mathematically possible, but we can't really say they're scientifically um, true. In fact, actually, black holes, right? Black holes used to be a mathematical possibility uh, from Einstein's day, and it wasn't until recently that we could actually show through interferometry that there were black holes. I mean, my goodness. Yeah, okay, I will agree with Stephen is essentially it's a set of explanations with predictive value. And uh, then, and yes, uh, if we want to call that a, a truth because uh, we all basically as peer reviews, reviewers say yes, all that um, lines up with what we predict. But on the other hand, we never want to say it's a fact, it's truth, it's the only way of looking at this because uh, we know that we don't know everything, and that's a humbling thing. Okay, so let's take a look at, uh, now that we are looking at all the uh, different ways uh, that the people have looked at science or what the uh, theory of science, let's look at it from a, a practice standpoint. That is, how have people thought about uh, science in the past? Uh, I do apologize. My presentation is a bit Eurocentric. If you were from another part of the uh, world, please interject about things and, and even in, in showing, you know, Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking and stuff, I uh, admit to um, um, an ignorance uh, about some of the other things that you might be able to present about other parts of the world. So let me know. Yep. Okay. There you go. Uh, observe, hypothesis, predict, test, etc. Now I want to go a little bit further on that because hypotheses, for example, are not something you do in qualitative research. Um, or testing, for example. So science is also can be quantitative, quantitative or qualitative. So, okay, so basically, if you look back in Europe anyway, the, the word curiosity itself was not used very much until the mid 1600s, about the time of Sir Isaac Newton and others in the area. And before that time, of course, asking questions about things was um, part and parcel of being 
human, but basically it was a lot of times when people ask how this works or why and such, it was for the purpose of finding practical purposes for them. And the other part of this was you had to be kind of careful because uh, we all know the saying, um, at least uh, um, people with English language know the saying, curiosity killed the cat. I'm not sure that <laughs> that, that translates to every language, but um, there were a lot of authorities that held that basically their truth was how things worked and why they were. And they were pretty adamant that other people didn't question that. And so it's only been uh, fairly recently that we have uh, been able to question some of those types of truth. In some time periods, it's been rather dangerous to question um, uh, truths of others. But here again in science, we're not saying we have the truth, we're just saying we have this as an explanation. And before, anybody know what science was called back, back in the, before the, oh, I don't know, 1800s. In other words, uh, before we actually had, um, yeah, um, curiosity killed the cat there. Natural, ooh, wow. Okay, a, a flurry of answers, natural philosophy. So if you think about it, natural philosophy was um, a, a way, ooh, that's a, okay, there, there you go, lots of languages and such. Um, natural philosophy was a philosophical way of looking at uh, nature instead of uh, people. I mean, philosophy is a lot about people and such, but you looked at nature. And before we had instruments and such that to be able to measure we had to go, oh my, there's stars up there, there's planets. Uh, how is it that they're not come crashing into the earth uh, like other earthly objects? Well, uh, perhaps they're not earthly objects. Perhaps there are um, other forces which are holding them up there. Um, perhaps they're divine, uh, which means that they're divine, then they don't have imperfections, therefore they must be circular, they're in circular or orbits and such, and, and so it went, and we had to do, the, and we did the same for a lot of other natural um, things we saw in the natural world. Uh, and then in the 1800s, yeah, okay, um, and Baragon, I agree with you there, in fact, actually that's kind of the start. But what they what kind of uh, started that is when you really, for example, observe nature and record it. What do you see, for example, with Mars orbit? Um, you are going to see Mars getting brighter and dimmer. And you can say, well, yeah, it's going around the sun, provided, of course, that the sun is in the center, not Earth. Um, so you had to concede that, and then you go, oh, oh my goodness. Uh, Earth is going in retrograde motion. Very good, Max. I didn't prompt her on this. <laughs> Not beforehand. She, she happened to guess what I was going to say next. Okay. Oh, my goodness. It's going backwards. What could possibly explain that? And if you had to stick with uh, circular orbits, then you basically had to say, well, there's these little epicycles, that is, circles within circles and stuff. And then it got really messy. Until, of course, somebody came up with a much more uh, simpler idea that, well, they're not circular orbits, they're elliptical and stuff. And, and even today, um, I was going to ask, for example, how many hours in a second life day? Anybody, th anybody thought about that? Anybody measured? Is there six? I thought there was four, but I may not have measured it. It's six? Four. That's what I thought. But uh, I don't know. I haven't checked it out lately. I mean, most of the time I come in, I go to uh, World, I set my um, six cycles. Ooh, okay, very good. Great, exactly. Six cycles with respect to uh, first life um, hours. But um, it is. It's specific time zone and stuff. And so one of the reasons I think, um, let's see, oh, I need to ask... Um, our um, uh, former Second Life um, 
Linden people here, but the idea is that I thought, yeah, Time Lords, exactly. Uh, I thought that one of the reasons was essentially because Second Life is a worldwide platform for connecting people, is that you couldn't have a particular cycle of time where it's uh, based on Pacific time uh, because of so many uh, people around the world. Of course, you can just go in and go, you know, world, sun, midday, or midnight, or whatever. And multiple, ooh, yeah, uh, actually, Max, I think I remember reading that. In other words, multiple sunrises, multiple sunsets. Um, that's why there's so many beaches in Second Life. In other words, it's the type of things we um, like to see. And the nights aren't so long, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, so, <laughs> uh, maybe, Mike, <laughs> that they, we've certainly found habitable zones around uh, red dwarfs uh, more than we have around. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, I know the feeling. Okay, so in any case, let's go. Let's take a look then at, in other words, in the 1800s, people began to get curious about the world and started studying different aspects of it. That's where fields of biology and physics and chemistry and stuff came about. And then once they did some study, uh, they would get together, uh, just like in philosophy circles, and they would discuss what they found and people would argue about it and then they would share what they found in scientific journals. And that essentially is the same today. And then the uh, scientific method, as we mentioned, as uh, was mentioned earlier, um, is much older, uh, but became better defined in this period. And it's not really a, a step by step process so much as it's a set of principles. So let's take a look at some of the principles associated with the scientific method. Um, one of the, uh, if you want to think of it as a belief, although it's more provable, like I said, is that if you're going to study some star, or a galaxy that's billions of light years away, you kind of have to start with the idea that uh, it's got the same physics, rules of physics, and the same elements and such that we have here. Uh, and that, in other words, if it didn't, then it'd be very difficult to study anything if it varied from meter to meter as you uh, went around. So. Uh, that's kind of a belief, but it's also somewhat of a provable thing. We can see uh, the spectra um, such. Of course, that's how we know that the universe was um, expanding, is uh, spectra uh, moving in fre um, uh, frequency movement, that sort of thing. Um, so in any case, um, yeah, uh, zero and, and such. Okay, so in any case, uh, the principles of scientific... Um, method are, first of all, you have to start out with curiosity, and curiosity leads to observation. Will the, Where will the sun come up tomorrow? Uh, that, that sort of thing. Um, now, observation doesn't have to be something that you can necessarily observe yourself. So, for example, I asked how many hours in a second life day, uh, but how many, or four hours, I guess, or six cycles. So, has the Earth Day always been 24 hours? That may be a trick question because we kind of define it as that, but has it always been? No, indeed. And how do we know that? We've observed it. Um, okay, it depends. In other words, if you go back to, in other words, if you go back to the time of the dinosaurs, it was actually about 23 hours. It and there again, Sisichi has uh, talked about how the tides, uh, the tidal action of the moon actually has been slowing down the earth. At one time, of course, the moon was closer. The moon uh, uh, actually gets further and further from the earth by about an inch per year. Um, so there's all these, and we can actually see this in the rocks. It and fossils and other evidence. So uh, when we say observe, I don't necessarily mean like go out and observe right now, but it, we can see it in things. Time's illusion, lunchtime. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So curiosity is the first thing. Why? How? Oh, now, by the way, why is not necessarily a science question. In other words, why does this exist, etc.? That's more 
uh, philosophical or religious question, but how is definitely a, um, a science question. Dark tea time of the saw. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, curiosity and observation, and then you have to ask questions. Um, they often say that Einstein didn't speak for many years when he was a kid and that when he grew up, he was able to ask questions like a child. And I think we all should do that. In other words, I think growing up completely is not recommended and that one way to enjoy life and to be curious and be a good scientist is to uh, ask the type of questions that, yeah, um, sometimes the profound questions are the simplest ones. Um, one of the profound questions that uh, from 20 years ago, which was a simple question, was um, a one that actually a woman scientist came up, and I wish I remember her name, but she basically was measuring, much like um, with the Hubble constant, there were a lot of measurements back then by a team of women scientists, and then Hubble kind of claimed <laughs> Uh, credit for some of it, but the idea back about 20 years ago is that a scientist was measuring uh, how fast stars uh, were um, and, and areas of the Milky Way and such were going around the middle. And in the solar system, we know, for example, is the outer planets take a long time to go around uh, the sun, but uh, the inner planets uh, zip around in, in days. So they were saying, oh, why are the outer arms, for example, of the Milky Way still arms for one, but why are they going around about the same speed as the ones of the inner? And so does anyone know what the uh, answer was, what they came up with, or what they said had to be in order for that to happen? How do you explain that? Yeah, dark matter. Um, and they, had, they basically said the only way for this to happen, or at least one explanation for this to happen is there has to be something that we do not see that interacts with gravity, but we don't see it interacting with other matter that we know of. And so, and there must be a lot of this stuff. And so it contributes to the overall kind of uh, making this an entire disk that all kind of goes around um, at the same uh, speed. And then uh, dark and, and so we were going, oh, that's kind of humbling. In other words, a lot of the um, matter out there we can't observe. And then another person discovered, oh, my goodness, the universe is not only expanding, but it's expanding at a greater rate. And how can it do that? And so they came up with dark energy. And so 20 years ago, essentially, they said, oh, my goodness, uh, only 5% of what we can see out there is matter that we know. So 95% of the universe we really don't know a whole lot about. And I think that's one of the most exciting things about science is not saying we know everything, but that we are humble. We <laughs> don't know everything. It isn't that wonderful. Is, uh, the, the world is uh, a wonderful place. Okay, that's interesting. There were shorter, in fact, actually, you know, uh, now not to diverge too much because we could easily talk about stuff like this for hours on end, but we try to keep it to about an hour. So uh, the people that are experimenting out in the desert about Martian days, of course, the Martian day is slightly longer than on Earth. So they basically have to readjust the uh, uh, their bodies and circadian rhythms and stuff, or try to, in order to uh, live a Martian day. Otherwise, you end up, I'm not sure. I don't think it's quite that long, but um, I do know it's uh, long enough that over a period of days, uh, you start, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, over a period of days, uh, you start to notice, and you may have to take a, a nap or something. Okay. So, any case, uh, so you try to explain why, and then you look for evidence, and you analyze that, and then one of the really good things about science is that you share. You go, <laughs> maybe that's just because of work there, Mike, but um, 
you share with other people and you go and they look at your work and they look very critically at it. This is peer review. And they go, okay, I understand your methods because you're very transparent with it. Uh, I see your data. I agree with your analysis and your conclusions. And therefore, oh, wow, uh, you just contributed to something new to the body of literature and what we know. And therefore, we may have to um, adjust our explanation of things a bit more. Um, well, yeah, there we go. Yeah, my understanding of their tagline was they thought, thought it was 24 hours, but actually it's a bit longer. In fact, maybe we're going to be a bit more comfortable with the Martian cycle. Ooh, are we from Mars? <laughs> no, nah, I'm just speculating. Okay, but maybe we're more comfortable with the Martian cycle when we get there. So, uh, the, on the slide up there are the principles of the scientific method and that we still do today. Okay, now, another way that science uh, is different from other ways of looking at things is that one is we need to have evidence. Um, the other thing is we need to look at all possible possible evidence. So, for example, what is the evidence that the Earth is flat? Do we have any evidence? Uh, my circadian rhythm. Not sure. Yeah, it's flat locally. That's right. I mean, it sure looks flat in second life. Ha! But then again, I think it is. Um, but that's an artificial world, but it kind of looks flat, right? But you can't stop there. In science, you can't stop there. So, for example, you have to look at all possible. Um, and then Netherlands, yeah, rather flat. Yeah, West Texas, too. Okay, so you have to look at all possible evidence. You just can't look at the evidence that agrees with what you believe. So, for example, one of the ways to fly in airplanes, never cross. <laughs> okay. One of the ways uh, to... Uh, see that is what happens if I were to what ha happens if a cruise ship pulls up right here outside the auditorium and then sails off into the distance now of course in second life they're going to run out of uh, region real quick but uh, if, it, if this were first life what would happen they'd get little they'd get smaller and smaller right okay but what else would happen what would you see if the ship as a ship yeah uh, they would okay they'd fall off the edge possibly uh but uh what would happen would be essentially you would uh you wouldn't see the whole ship get smaller and smaller essentially the yeah there we go essentially the hull would start to get less, less high and then you wouldn't see the um hull of the ship and all you'd see would be the mass and that sort of thing and then of course you know, later on, we've got satellites, and the, and the satellites sure look like the Earth is uh, round. And so the idea in science is that it's not just evidence. It's you have to consider all of the evidence, because if there's any evidence that does not explain the phenomenon, then you have to consider it. And the other thing is reproducing it. It can't be something that um, behind the wall of ice oh, could be. I mean, the, the ice flows look flat. Okay. So... Um, you have to be able to reproduce it. And that's why you're very transparent in the scientific journals and stuff. This is my question. This is the data I, I gathered. This is how I did it. This is how I analyzed it. This are the conclusions I got. So that other people can reproduce that and hopefully get the same results under the same conditions. And then of course the idea is that uh, it's open to modification. Um, yeah, and I want to say one thing about hypotheses is that in quantitative research, you've got hypotheses. In other words, you've got this thing that you actually, in fact, actually for people that do research, they, they know that what you're trying to uh, verify, what you're looking at is actually the null hypothesis so that you don't buy it, bias. In other words, if you think this you're trying to actually prove the opposite and there and then if you can't uh, prove 
uh, significantly that the opposite is true, then the other side must be true. <laughs> Um, okay, so any case, but in qualitative research, you, there's still uh, scientific ways of analyzing, and you uh, come up with basically qualitative uh, data, and then analyze it, come up with conclusions and stuff as well. Okay, so uh, that is science. Now let's take a look then at, uh, that's science both in theory and practice. So let's take a look then at what we're trying to do, trying to do here. And so science is hands-on. And right now I'm giving a presentation. This is uh, similar to the other presentations we've uh, given. But what I'm inviting you to do is go on a journey, not just uh, a single uh, presentation. Um, what I mean by that is let me take a look at what I wrote in the description for this session is essentially We'll start our journey by reaching a common understanding of the nature of science and uh, STEAM. Now, I need to explain that one. Does anyone know what, um, in other words, and what I would like to do is I would simply like to facilitate this journey. In other words, I don't claim to be an expert on everything. I don't claim I have the truth, uh, uh, but I have taught for years and I hope to be able to uh, facilitate our journey a bit. And so what I'd like to do is, uh, what is STEAM anyways? Ah, there we go, STEM plus arts. So I'd like to kind of just like a research normally does, I'd like to kind of focus on science, technology, engineering, math, and art. Um, arts, much like uh, kind of a post-positivist uh, philosophy, art it, it is. Uh, but the reason why I wanted to mention is it's not uh, a term that you use everywhere in the world. Um, steam is hot. <laughs> Good. Um, and actually, what I'm trying to do where the session is called Exploring Science and Second Life, that's also a double entendre, like steam is hot. In other words, um, we're not necessarily just going to explore the science that we find in Second Life, but I'd sure like to start there. In other words, I'd like to have field trips and scavenger hunts and building things and uh, visits by experts. And in other words, the idea is to use Second Life as a platform for a global exploration of, of science. Um, and so uh, Art, I want to, in other words, one of the things, if you actually look on this island, for example, what do you see? Anybody wander around this island? What science do we see on Second Life Island? Or Second Science Circle Island, sorry. Can you, are you curious about things? Mike, ooh, there is, oh, there you go. Boundary where, yeah, in other words, why the boundary where the water meets the land generally is called, unless it's a lake, it's called the sea level. But has the sea level always been the same? Have you ever tried to raise the sea level on second, on Science Circle Island? <laughs> what is the sea level in Second Life? Anybody happen to know? If you're a builder, you probably know. How high is the sea level from, yeah, 20 meters? Okay. So in other words, the, the, the deepest ocean you can get in Second Life, provided you use the default uh, sea level, is 20 meters. However, has anyone ever tried to raise the sea level on one of the Second Life? Yeah, uh, you can. Um, and you can raise it to whatever. You can flood the entire island if you want. Uh, I don't know how high it will go, but um, I've played with it before, and it's somewhat disconcerting to be just like flooding and um, a, tide, a uh, storm surge with a hurricane. It's somewhat disconcerting when the water uh, is lapping at your knees instead of uh, further down in, in second life and in real life, or I mean first life. Yeah, okay, so why would this island be here? In other words, if this is the first life island, what causes islands? What causes bumps in islands? In other words, not flat islands. Um, 
why is Second Life sky blue? Is it blue? Are skies always blue? Why is the water blue? Can you turn it something else? Uh, if you're a builder, you might know some of the answers, but of course that's artificial. Um, where the land in the water meets the land in the waves, where's the boundary? Okay, that's a good question because they often have to come up with mean sea level, in other words, some sort of uh, uh, level. Uh, also, there's tides and stuff. So yeah, water reflects in the side. Uh, why are we able? Why are we standing in second life? In other words, why is there the gravity is of here? Are, is a, is gravity different? Uh, all of these sorts of things that if you were um, really thought about it, we can explore. The other thing is we've had a lot of phenomenal presentations over many years in the science circle. And yet, I would be willing to bet that not everybody here understands the science behind all of the presentations we've had. And so that's one of the things. So I'd like to first start out by, yeah, it, 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 well, you know, now the interesting thing, Syzygy, is that when I was first in Second Life, I showed it to a bunch of uh, university professors at, at my university. and. What I did was I went up on top of a building and jumped off and I didn't die. And then I, my avatar got up and one of the professors immediately got up and said, I'm not going to do this because I, I don't know whether he expected me to die or something, but um, he basically said, you know, this is not real, so I'm not going to be part of it. Um, <laughs> so, um, I thought that was a very interesting reaction uh, from you have, okay, um, but it's a very interesting reaction uh, that that he had. And so, in any case, uh, yeah, I kn I know. Uh, so I yeah, I don't know quite what the the deal was. Okay, uh, do you accelerate when you fall. Um, now, Max, that's actually a very interesting thing. And I have I have a parachute. I mean, I've gone up really high and. Uh, free fall and then use the parachute and stuff. And I think that you reach terminal velocity at a very quick rate. Now you can actually, yes, you reach terminal velocity very quickly. And so, uh, but you can actually, in other words, if you were to build, say, a big measurement stick and point it into the air and then measured it on the way down, you could figure that out. I mean, that's a basic uh, phys a physics problem, but we can do that. Has anyone, by the way, ever ever made a object physical in Second Life? In other words, most of the objects you make by default are not physical. Yes, it's fun. You can do a lot of cool things with physical objects to demonstrate stuff. Absolutely. So let's do stuff. And you can make bouncy things. That's right. All you have to do is change the physical properties and such. So the idea is that um, let's explore a little bit. Let's answer some questions. As we journey together, let's have a goal uh, to develop a guide uh, to science in Second Life. There used to be, by the way, and I don't mean just in Second Life, but you know, Second Life plus open sources that will explain uh, science of our presentations and stuff. You weigh more than a duck. Oh, that's a Monty Python um, Holy Grail thing. <laughs> uh, or, or no, what was it? Um, yeah, okay. Um, so in any case, let's, or let's develop a guide. There used to be a guide long ago in 2006, 2007 time period that was made by, I think it was uh, Troy McLuhan, who was the same one that made my slide viewer. And he had a guide to all things science and science. Come on. And then, uh, yeah, we used to have one exactly, Max. Uh, and, and that was, I think, Troy McLuhan. And then he gave it to me and I kept it up for a bit. And then actually the list went to Jan, uh, Laria, who's in our, um, that second life things, um, in our, in the science circle. And he kept it up for some period of time. And it'd be kind of fun to, to develop that again and to see how science is represented in second life. And also whether it's rep like, if you haven't been, okay, I'm going to advertise this a little bit. If you haven't been to G Genome Island, it's one of the more phenomenal science places that you can go to about genetics and such. And I know Max 
uh, uses it for classes and such and has for many, many years. Um, and there are other places as well that both represent science. Yeah, uh, if you haven't, look it up. Um, I would highly recommend. That's one of my uh, favorite places, both earlier and now. And so uh, take a look at that. And so let's develop a guide and for the purpose of kind of promoting dialogue and education along the STEAM disciplines. And I will help facilitate this. So essentially this, it's not just a single uh, spiral staircases. Yep, okay. Um, it's not a single presentation. What I'm inviting you to do is let's get back together again on a semi-regular basis. Uh, uh, I can put information in um, the Science Circle website. Uh, uh, our uh, fearless leaders and terribly overworked um, uh, directors here, uh, uh, Chantel and Jess, have set up a site already uh, for the website, and so I'll put some stuff in there. Uh, I'm inviting you to attend as many, many sessions as you're able, and let's have some fun. Like, let's go over to take a look at Genome Island. Let's get some experts. I've, I'll arrange with Max, hopefully, <coughs> that she can um, uh, walk us around and, and show us some of the stuff that's there. And um, let's have some fun. And, and, and if you haven't built, I'm sure we can find some place to be sorry, <laughs> jeans. Okay, uh, be, uh, uh, build some things and there's uh, like, for oh, there's also, uh, what is the, the, the chemistry part? I guess somebody already mentioned that. All the little chemical molecules and stuff um, that's here on this island. Let's build things, let's have some visits by experts. Let's find questions there. Oh, excellent, thank you. I've already got a tour lined up, yay. Okay, um, yeah, that was my first, um, biochemistry was my first degree and so, so We'll post this information and so you can catch up on the sessions you missed, uh, know what's coming up, and uh, we can also have perhaps a FAQ, uh, frequently asked questions or a place where you can pose questions and people who are experts, um, yes, <laughs> that, yeah, uh, people who are experts in our, our group or in other groups. Um, speaking of chemistry, there used to be an American Chemical Society group in Second Life. And so as we kind of gauge the interest that we have, uh, this is not a replacement for presentation, it's a compliment. It's our, it's uh, the science circle branching out uh, to new uh, uh, areas. We may even have a formal course that you can register and stuff. And basically, and there may be some homework. Um, so basically, and, and not mandatory homework, I don't want to, in fact, that's why I'm resisting calling this a class, because it's really a journey that we go on together to learn and uh, to explore. And so, uh, but there may be some challenges, uh, in other words, visit places or online to help reinforce session activities, prepare for next session, that sort of thing. So, let's see. Uh, okay, good. Tagline. That, that's, in fact, actually you kind of led into what I have next. We tried to wrap things up in an hour, so we have about five minutes to wrap things up. Is So are there things you're particularly interested in? Like Max said, is uh, do we accelerate when we fall? <laughs> That'd be fairly easy to, to measure, I think. Anything else that you're, that you've always wanted to know that maybe there's someone out there that um, let's see, examples of percent. Yeah, there you go. Absolutely. Okay, so even if you may not have, okay, does, who does pay for the pure science, oh, for the pure science, or, ah, Arian, um, we are paid in, as actually my, my wife um, gave me this written thing, <laughs> She says, basically, we are paid in, we're true, we're rewarded with knowledge and understanding. <laughs> and also the fact that we can interact with um, other people from around the world. I mean, that's part of my attraction to being here. And so that's also why in my humility, I basically say, I don't know anything. And so that's why I'm not just talking to myself, I'm talking to uh, you guys from around the world. And I'd love 
for you to join me on a journey of exploration. Yeah, donations are nice. But we basically all pay for the pure science <laughs> circle activities. Okay, uh, we got about five minutes. I'm going to wrap it up now. There's nothing saying we have to go for an hour. And I appreciate uh, your taking time to come today. And I'd really like to invite you on the journey and you'll hear more from us about what's next. And maybe somebody can go out there and uh, tell us whether you accelerate uh, when you fall. <laughs> okay. So thank you. I'll wrap it up and um, you guys take care and you'll be hearing more. Yeah, I'm hoping it's fun.